you know, I've not looked at it that way before, but in a way, I guess so. Um, Because the the aim behind the book is is just to, to make people aware of the different ways in which they uh, attempt to manipulate us so that you can kind of go wait a minute I see what they're doing here they're trying to get me into the pit of despair I'm not climbing down into that pit I'm just going to let them waffle on do their stuff but I'm not going to get in the pit there and we'll, we'll see what the offer is at the end of it so that you can um, again as I say there's nothing wrong with nothing wrong with sales it's when, when they try to manipulate you and even if they are trying to manipulate you sometimes that thing is actually a good deal for you and it is what what you need and want so there's nothing wrong with buying it but just be aware that you are making the decision rather than them making you think you've made the decision um uh, a few months ago i did uh, i did a survey on a few different social media platforms i tried several different platforms to see if there were differences pretty much the same result across across all of them i asked the question on a scale of zero to ten where zero is absolutely not at all, and 10 is, I don't care, here's my credit card, how easily could you be manipulated into buying something? Most people said, rated themselves around about one or two. No, nope, I could never be manipulated into buying anything. The reality is most people are around the seven to nine level. But we do, we think we're not manipulated, manipulable. That's a mouthful. And <laughs> we think we can't be manipulated, which actually puts us, gives us a false sense of security, which means we're not on the lookout for any attempts to manipulate us because we don't think it can happen, which is why it's so easy for us to fall for it. A couple of people did, um, did, um, I say, stumble upon what's actually going on because a couple of them said, nope, I could never be manipulated into buying something. I only buy something if I want it. And that's the key. Hey, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I have a guest joining me from across the pond, as we like to say, from me here in Canada. Keith is with me, and we're going to be talking about a lot of great things. And a new book just came out, like the time of recording just came out, and we're all going to have to go buy it today. Uh, Keith, welcome to the podcast. Nice to have you here. How are you? Lovely to be here, David. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm doing really good, thanks. I am fantastic, as always. Okay, let's start right off the top. The book just came out, like just just recently. Can you hold it up for us? Let's let's do this. Some screen time. There it is. Look at that. Tell there us about go. it. Tell us about it. Come on. Yeah. So it's it's called anti manipulation, and it's exposing the tools, tricks, and techniques which the unscrupulous use to manipulate us into buying their stuff. Um, whether like, that's a, perhaps, like a new book, for example. Well, so, like a no. new book. Yes. Well. I you, as you might imagine, when I talk about the book, I get I almost always get somebody saying, "Oh, well, maybe you're manipulating me into buying your book." To which I always reply, "If you feel that, don't buy it. Simple yeah. as that. If you think I'm manipulating you into buy it, please step away. Do not buy it." Yeah, I guess yeah. there's a there's a big difference, all right, Keith, between oh yeah the unscrupulous, which is what you mentioned, and then we all we're all consumers, we're all purchasing, we're all. And yeah. just the understanding how the buying decision happens and how we're influenced and how we can just be aware, I guess, is the one thing I'm thinking, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there is absolutely nothing wrong with sales. As you say, we're, we're all consumers. Many of us sell stuff. Um, we want to buy something. A shop or a person or a company has some, has the thing we want to buy. We uh, we enter into a, into a contract, which is usually a case of we hand them the money, they hand us the goods. Everybody's happy. There's absolutely nothing wrong with with sales at all, and I would say there's also nothing wrong with um, with genuine uh, advertising as well, or uh, attempting to to um, convince someone, hey, you know what, you really do need to buy this this widget, whatever it is, mm-hmm. and uh, tell him all the good things. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's when you step over that and step into uh, manipulating people, being unscrupulous, trying to um yeah manipulate them into wanting to buy something even though they don't want it don't need it can't afford it uh so it's it's all those nasty underhand tricks that you're trying to trick them into buying it because it's more important for you that they buy it than it is for them to make the decision of whether to buy or not and um somebody asked me 
how do you know whether you've stepped beyond influence or persuasion and gone mm -hmm. into manipulation? Yeah. And I would say a great, a great way to work out, am I manipulating or am I just being, uh, attempting to persuade them is would you be happy explaining to them exactly what you are doing and why? The if method, you're happy right? to the explain method. it. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, if it's like, look, you know what, David, I am really going over all the, all the, the benefits here because I can see why this would benefit you. I want to make sure you fully understand everything that's involved here. And I'm not sure you do. So I'm going to, I'm going to go over them again. Being open and honest. So that, that's, that's uh, persuasion. But on the other hand, if I'm trying to manipulate you and, and, and work on you at a psychological level and unconscious level to kind of force you into a position where you go, oh, I really need that. I'm not really going to be wanting to say, hey, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to manipulate you and make mm -hmm. you feel worthless and then offer mm -hmm. this as, as a hook, and that's going to make you want to buy it. You're not going to want to say that because it's manipulative. So basically, if you're happy to tell people what you're doing, it's not manipulative. But if you're going, oh, I hope they don't find out, mm -hmm. it's and manipulative. Oh, I love it. Okay, so we're, I have a I have a suggestion for this episode. Let's use your new book as a case study, and let's use it as an example as we go through the episode. As because what I, the request I'm getting from authors that come on the show is they want to sell their book, they want to sell their program, they have something to offer the world, but they don't want to be salesy, and they don't mm -hmm. want to make people feel like they're being sold to. Yeah, but they have something that would really help someone especially when they're meeting them one-on-one -on -one like this and they're, you know, I have an answer for you. And how do I, how do I share that with my audience without feeling like I'm doing a commercial for myself? Right. So I'd love to use your book as an example, because you're here to sell the book. Well, that's yeah, that's, that's very true. upfront, right? Let's, exactly. yeah, we're doing the podcast to sell a book. Let's be quite honest. That's why mm -hmm. we're here. So yeah, yeah. let's use your book and kind of tailor this episode for a listener. So they can take notes and go, oh, I get it. I get it. So do you mind us using you as a little example today? I love that as an idea. I love that. Okay. Let's do it. All Let's right. do okay. it, David. All right. So give me a bad example of manipulation for selling your particular book that makes even you go, oh, I would never do this. And again, <laughs> we're going to leave this in context. I'm not going to pull this out as a soundbite and go, look what he did. Sure. I get In you. context <laughs> with our conversation, okay, what would you say is a bad approach to reaching out to somebody to sell your book, for example? Ooh, now that's that's a question and a half, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is made slightly more difficult, uh, not because I'm now trying to figure out how to manipulatively sell my book, uh, but it's made more difficult because there's no one single thing. Okay. No one sort of single thing that you do to manipulate people. Well, usually there's not. Uh, because it's, um, it's sort of build up layer upon layer. Use lots and lots of different manipulative techniques. Okay. Different ones will work with different people. And then once you've got one, add another one in, turn the screw a bit more and add another one and turn the screw a bit more. So th there's not a, a single single approach the perhaps the closest to a single approach that uh you might see um is uh often referred to as the pit of despair mm. now this is normally used as part of the whole overall process but it is a, uh it can or it could potentially be put to uh to use as just a, a single standalone um approach and the way that the pit of despair would work, I'm not entirely convinced it would work for the, for the book, but hey, you never know. But the way the pit, the pit of despair works is you get effectively you, you get or encourage, uh, the person that you're targeting, encourage them to, to really focus on whatever the pain point that you're claiming to solve would be. Get them to really focus on that pain point and get them to really see how how awful life is because of that. Look at all the things it's stopping you from doing, 
all of those dreams you have that you know you will never achieve because, mm, yeah. let's face it, your life is rubbish because of this pain point, because you are allowing this pain point to hold you back. You've chosen to allow this pain point to stop you from experiencing all those lovely, wonderful things. You really layer this on them. Get them feeling like, oh, man, life is life really sucks. This is horrible. Yeah. Then you go, okay, you know what, David? Just imagine. Imagine if you did nothing about that. Imagine if you continue to fall for every single scam that's around there, spending all your money on all, all of these scams and, and all of these things. So you didn't have money to do those things that you really want to do. And ima just imagine what your life is like five years from now. Just picture yourself five years from now, and you've still been falling for all of these manipulative sales techniques. Mm. How sucky is your life now? Yeah. What are all the things you've missed out on? And now let's step out 10 years. 10 years in the future, 10 years of constant missed opportunity. You've, you've allowed yourself to fall for all of these scams, for all of these, these bait and switch, for all of these things. You've allowed yourself to be manipulated all of these times. It's now 10 years. We're in 2033. Hmm. How sucky is your life? All those things that you've missed out on. And it's, it's kind of getting a bit late now to, to be, to be turning things around in 2033, right? Yeah. Lifespans are, are not as, as big as we think. Yep. And really get them feeling really miserable. And it's often the, those who, who teach, because th there are plenty out there who teach all of these tools. When they teach the pit of despair, they will say, if you can get them crying, as in not just a slight single tear running down the cheek, but you can get them actually crying buckets and you have to hand them their, their, their tissue paper to... Mm. then you're on to a winner it's horrible stuff but you get them to imagine all of that you go, okay you know what david what if instead of all that what if you were able to find a way to stop falling for all of those things mm -hmm. imagine all the money you would save what's that worth to you what does that get you and you get then get them imagining how wonderful life will be if they could just overcome this thing mm -hmm. Amazingly wonderful. And I mean, you would, you, you've what? You, you spent thousands, tens of thousands over the years on all these things you didn't really want to buy. Yeah. Imagine five years from now, those thousands of pounds that you've saved. Just imagine the wonderful yeah. holidays you can take. Yep. All those beautiful things you can do. Isn't that worth $15? Mm hmm. Why yeah. not? And then swoop in and sell the book because basically i'm getting you to go yeah my life is really horrible oh if i could do that it would be worth thousands to me how could i possibly turn down giving you 15 dollars in order to save myself thousands and to save myself all of that all of that despair and that's how the pit of despair works in in, in, a, in a very brief nutshell mm -hmm. there's lots of other things that they can they can throw into to really really um really ramp it up including lots of things like anchoring uh, where you previously throughout the, the event or the other talk or, or sales pitch or whatever, you've anchored in all sorts of negative stuff. So you really bring all of that to play in the pit of despair, hmm. but it's get them to feel like, you know what, what's the point? There's no point in life anymore. Oh, wow. This, this widget that you've got save me all of this. Oh my God. Yes. I want it. Let me buy it now. Even though it probably won't make that big a difference to them, even though they don't necessarily want it, need it. Maybe they can't afford it. That's a, a big one with manipulation. Mm -hmm. Tell you these things that you can't afford, but they'll manipulate you into, into finding ways to supposedly afford it. Yeah. Even though they're not there, they're horrible ways that they get you to do that as well. Okay. So that's a good example. I like yeah, the bit the of bit despair. The bit of despair would probably be if one were to attempt to, to, to sell something like the book mm -hmm. using a manipulative approach, the pit of despair would probably be uh, a powerful way to go about it. Okay, so now let's give the complete opposite of that. How would you approach, how can, how can an author or someone who has a course, a coach, offers a, a service or a solution without going to the pit of despair? What's the alternative? The alternative is, first of all, make sure that you're speaking to people who might be interested in what you have to offer. Yeah. So rather than force them into wanting to buy it, 
find the sort of people who like what you have, the sort of people who might be interested in it, the sort of people who might go, do you know what? I'm interested in that. Tell me a bit more. And you, you, you build up rapport with them, build up connections with them. Give them, give them content. I mean, like, like I'm doing here, so, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff that we've talked about is directly in the book. I'm basically giving you chapters from the book completely free. Uh, anybody who listens to this who goes, Hey, I like that. I'm not going to buy the book, but I'm going to watch out for the pit of despair. Even if only one person stops falling into the pit of despair, I'm more than happy. Whether they hmm. buy the book or not, it doesn't matter. Help somebody and they're, they're going to hopefully have a slightly better life because they're not falling for some of these things. So don't be afraid to give, give some of the, 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 the content away. Let people see how it could help them and let them make up their own mind. Is that something that I want? Can that help me? Yes, actually it might. Let me, let me buy it or yeah, I don't think that's for me. In which case, don't buy it. Absolutely not a problem. I hope you found what we uh, what we shared useful. So it's oh, it's God. it's about just being open. Just kind of you can kind of think of it as um, if you go down um, if you walk into into a supermarket, they are blatantly there to sell you the stuff. That's why they exist. Yeah. We know that's why they exist. They got all of their their, their products and, and and wares uh, on display. You can see everything. There's nobody there going, "Oh, you should buy this. Oh, buy this. Oh, buy this." You're <laughs> yeah. just walking there, going, "You know what? Actually, I fancy that. Yep, I need some shampoo. Oh, I could do with some fresh bread. Yeah, we'll get some of that. You just buy the bits that you want. Or you might, it might be raining outside, and you're waiting for a mate, and you're, you're you've got uh, ten minutes to, to spare, and you don't want to be standing out in the rain. I was nipping to the shop, just have a look around, pretend I'm going to buy something, and then walk out when it's time to meet them. They don't mind either way. They're not that fussed. Yeah. They're not trying to force you into buying it. It's just, hey, you want to buy the stuff? You know what it is? There it is. If you don't want to buy it, no problem. Maybe you'll want to buy next time. Who knows? Okay. So the one thing about sales that catches me, and I hear people talk about, is the pressure behind the sales. Mm. There's the words. Mm. There's the pit of despair. But then there's the pressure where you might walk into a retail shop and then you are on their radar and they follow you and they're right there with you every minute. And they're just like, how about this? How about this? How about this? You're like, just give me a second. Just give me a second. Uh, or you you go to buy a vehicle and they're right there with you and they take you through the steps and they take get you through everything. Don't you, take right? no for an answer. Right? Yeah. You, you are but- with you. Yeah. What you talk, talk about uh, buy, buying a vehicle? Um, I mean, used car sales and, and even new car sales historically has had a very bad reputation because there have been lots of um, lots of sharks in there. To be fair to them, they have cleaned up their act a lot over the over recent decades. It, it is a lot better than it was. There are still some who will use manipulative techniques, and one one that I've I've come across. Uh, or one particular one that I've come across, you might have a car and you're going to do a part exchange. So you go there, you've agreed everything. It's time to, it's the day to do the part exchange. So you, you, you go there, walk in. Hey, yeah, I'm here to buy the, the whatever. Have you got the keys to your car? Yep. Yeah, eh, Cause we want to check it over and just make sure everything's like, yeah, no bother. There's the keys. There's the keys to the car. Right, let's sit down. Let's go over the paperwork and, and all that. All seems very above board. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. They start going through whatever they're doing with the paperwork. They start trying to pull a fast one by uh, adding in little extra charges that you weren't really uh, prepared for or, mm-hmm. or suddenly decide that your car is actually worth less than they'd, uh, they'd uh, agreed it was worth. And okay. Don't forget you've got to cut, you've got to have the insurance as well and all these things and mounting it up and mounting it up. And you reach the point you go, you know what? Actually, but this isn't such a good deal. Uh, I don't want to buy this. I'm, I'm going to walk. Can I have my keys back? What I've seen some of them, do, what I've seen some do is they will go, oh, oh, you can't have your keys back because what we have to do whenever we get a car in for part exchange, we have to put the keys into a locked safety box. Nobody here. They can get access to it. The only people who can get access are head office when they come round once a fortnight to collect those cars. Mm. We have no access to, to the to the keys, and that's safe. We can't give you your car back. Wow. 
even though it's complete and utter nonsense. And if you phone the police, <laughs> all of a sudden they find a way to open that safe. Mm-hmm. But yeah, oh, wow. applying pressure like that to to really push you into signing on that dotted line. It's like, come on, that that is manipulative in the extreme. Okay, what a great example, <laughs> and that's and that's what I fear. I guess that's maybe why people go to the the bad side of sales and think that we're all everyone's out trying to get us. Everyone mm. knows a little bit more than we do. If I go into a computer store. And I'm like, hello, I'd like to buy a new computer. And the staff look at me. They'll throw a softball question at me to see my response. You know, and it's a techni- technical term. Mm-hmm. And if I can't, if I look dazed and confused or I have no idea what they've said, it's like Christmas. They just know that this guy doesn't know he anything about signs, computers. Eyes, I can yeah. tell them anything I want. But if I can answer the question or if I can school them, they seem to back off a little bit because they're like, mm. oh, this guy knows his stuff, right? I'm just going to back up. No, well, how can I serve you? What can I do? Get you out the door, mm. right? So yeah, I don't like that. Ba- I don't like, like that feeling of being yeah, lesser I, I, I of a mean. yeah. Okay, and and again, we 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 should we should we should stress not every shop is like no. that. No, no, no. There are many who are as honest as the day is long, and they will. If you know apps, if you know practically nothing about computers. They will take the time to yes, uh, you find the one you want. As you point out, though, there are those who go, ha ha, let's see how much we can, we can get this one for, how much mm-hmm. we can shake this one down for. Um, actually, I had, I had some fun with, um, with one of those one time. I was, I was, uh, I was actually over in, in the US in, um, California, um, on, on business. And my background is in IT. I've got a, uh, a degree in computer microprocessor engineering. And I used to work in IT for 20 years, uh, building, building, um, server farms for multi, multi million dollar farms and so on. So I've <laughs> got a, a good knowledge of this stuff. And I was there with a friend and we were just kind of passing the time. We, we popped into the, one of these shops because we wanted to buy a, uh, a couple of bits and pieces and <laughs> had a bit of fun. Uh, one of them asked that, that softball question. And I just kind of, I no idea. What, I don't know. No idea what you're talking about. And so you could see them going, ha and it started, started all the hard sell and all, all the stuff. And then, um, turned around and completely outdid them with all the, all the jargon and everything. <laughs> it was, it was, it was entertaining, but it was also at the same time, a little bit sort of, if I genuinely hadn't known, I would have probably spent hundreds of dollars that I didn't need to spend. Yeah. How many other people does this happen to? Yeah. Um, I think. A key thing with that, as as with any, as with any sales, really, uh, anytime you're, you're you're buying, a key thing is be as prepared as you can. Do do whatever um, preparation you can. Do your homework, basically, yeah. <laughs> before before you you go to the shop. Find out as much as you reasonably can about whatever it is that you're buying. And if it is something that's way way beyond you, bring a friend who knows who knows a bit yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I know very little about, uh, not that knowledgeable about cars. I'll I'll admit it. I mean, when I had my first car, I got the. I don't know if you have it over in, in Canada. We have a thing called the Haynes Manual. Haynes Publishing. They they okay. yeah. they get a car. You know, they get a car, yeah. strip it down, re- build it back up, document everything, and that's you you can basically pretty much keep anything running with 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 the Haynes Manual. So I used to have that for my very my first car because also when you spend about. A couple of hundred bucks on a car it's not mm-hmm. really good <laughs> so yeah. you, you, um but uh these days i'm uh, less less knowledgeable about cars and what to look out for and so on so when i went to buy one i took a friend along who who um who lives and breathes cars mm-hmm. so that i knew that they would be able to let me know if if the dealer was trying to pull a fast one to the dealer's credit they weren't they were completely open and honest and it, it was really good but it was reassuring yeah having the, the the fact that I had somebody there who could go, oh, that's rubbish. Um, yeah. And the other big thing, which made me feel much more comfortable with with that dealer, I've for a long time had a policy of never never making a, a, a snap decision when, when buying things. If it's if it's a reasonable amount of money, I always want to think about it. So we went there, they had the test drive of the car and everything. Yeah, that's all really nice. And I said, I said to them. 
Yeah, I, I never make snap decisions. I want to think about it. I'm going to go home today, think about it, and I'll give you a call tomorrow and let you know either way. Many places will try the whole, oh, well, it might be sold by tomorrow. And oh, what is it you do? What is it you need to think about? Let's let's solve that now. They just went, absolutely fine. Let us know tomorrow whether you want to buy it or not. Either's good. Wow. Okay. And in, that, like, in that moment, how did you feel? In that moment? In that moment, I thought, I can trust these. I can trust these, uh, these, this dealer. There. Um, <laughs> my friend who was with me said, I knew you were going to buy that car because when you came back, they grinned on your face. <laughs> No two ways about you gonna but I said to them, I need I need to think about it. I'll give you a call tomorrow. And they just yeah. said, Take all the time you need. We're nice. here when you made a decision. It's like that's customer service. That's that's a dealer who wants to sell to people who want to buy, rather than a dealer who just wants to sell, sell, sell and, and to heck with the, the consequences. So that feeling of having a friend who knows automobiles with you as you mm. walk up and down the rows of cars and yeah, just having them there with you, mm. that that feeling of security and knowledge, and um, I guess safety in the sense that you, if you have a question, they're there. Is that the same feeling that you're hoping people have when they buy this book? Oh, you know, I've not looked at it that way before, but in a way, I guess so. Because um, the the aim behind the book is is just to to make people aware the different ways in which they uh, attempt to manipulate us so that you can kind of go, wait a minute, I see what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get me into the pit of despair. I'm not climbing down into that pit. I'm just going to let them off and do their stuff, but I'm not going to get in the pit there. And we'll, we'll see what the offer is at the end of it. So that you can, um, again, as I say, there's nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with sales. It's when, when they try to manipulate you. And even if they are trying to manipulate you, sometimes that thing is actually a good deal for you and it is what, what you need and want. So there's nothing wrong with buying it. But just be aware that you are making the decision rather than them making you think you've made the decision. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a few months ago, I did, uh, I did a survey on a few different social media platforms. I tried several different platforms to see if there were differences pretty much the same result across across all of them. I asked the question, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is absolutely not at all, and 10 is, I don't care, here's my credit card, how easily could you be manipulated into buying something? Most people said, rated themselves around about 1 or 2. No, nope, I could never be manipulated into buying anything. The reality is most people are around the 7 to 9 level. But we do, we think we're not manipulated, mm -hmm. manipulable. That's a mm. mouthful. And we go. think we can't be manipulated, <laughs> yeah. which actually puts us, gives us a false sense of security, which means we're not on the lookout for any attempts to manipulate us because we don't think it can happen. Right. Which is why it's so easy for us to fall for it. A couple of people did um, did um, as they stumble upon what's actually going on. Because a couple of them said, no, nope, I could never be manipulated into buying something. I only buy something if I want it. And that's the key. These unscrupulous people, they're not manipulating us into buying the thing. They're manipulating us into wanting to buy the thing. And then they just happen to come along with an offer. Sometimes an offer that's too good to be true. But hey, it's a short offer. It's going to disappear by the end of this course or by the end of today. Or I've only got five of these left or... So they're still piling on the pressure, but they've manipulated you into wanting to buy it, mm. which is a much easier thing. It's all about manipulating our emotion. And then when you want to buy it, you go, oh, yeah. They then add the whole um, pressure, the time, the, the limits. They, oh, we've yeah. only got five of these, or yeah. the offer closes at midnight or whatever. To stop you going, let me think about this and come back tomorrow, by which time all the manipulative um, impact would have would have dissipated. You're going, oh, I quite like it. Oh, God, they've only got five of them. Oh, and the offer closes in 10 minutes. Let's buy it. Let's buy it mm. before we miss out because I don't want to miss out on this because I can see there's seven people up there all looking to buy already. Let me get in there with my card and get it before it sells out. And you end up buying this thing that you've been manipulated into wanting and you buy it without pausing to, to take the time to work out, is this actually what I want? Is it a good deal? Will it do what I need? Can I afford it? All of those sorts of things. Nice. So when you're writing this book, did you have somebody in mind that this would be the perfect book for this 
specific person? Yes, in a way. Um, I thought it would be the ideal book for for uh, me from about 20, 25 years ago, I, mm. I guess, basically. Um, it's the sort of book that I would have found useful and would have stopped me buying some, some things. Wouldn't have stopped me buying others, but it, it would have either stopped me buying some stuff or at least made me uh, consider it more carefully. So, uh, okay. yeah. So I, mean, I, I, I hate to sort of say, oh, this book is for anyone, but realistically, this book is for anyone <laughs> because it, it, it's helping. It's giving us, giving us um, the advantage, putting us back in control of the whole, uh, the whole dynamic. Um, so it's, if you want to basically just make sure that when you buy something, you're buying it because it's right for you and you have decided you want to buy it. You're not buying it because they have made you believe you want to buy it. Okay, so for the authors that are listening then, let's jump back to that. We talked about the beginning about this. Mm -hmm. Any any suggestions from your point of view as a fellow author on, I have my book, I have, it's published, I'm ready to promote it, and I want to do it the right way. Yeah. Where do I start? I I would say the place to start is long before you've published the book, before you've before you've even completed writing the book. Okay, um, and that's that's a lesson that's taken me a a, a bit of uh, a few goes to learn. I'm, I I uh, I have to say, uh, because if you basically turn up to the market and go, "Hey, I've got this book. Who wants to buy it?" Yeah, that's nice. There's yeah. what ten thousand books published every day, or I don't know what the actual figure is, but it's a ridiculous amount of, of new titles come out every day. Um. If you're, and it's, just, it's really it's the same with it with anything. If, if you just suddenly appear in the market and say, "Hey, I've got a widget. Who wants to buy it?" Why do I want that? It's, it's, ve it's a very very hard sell. But if you can build a, make sure that this is something that people people want, mm -hmm. people want, people need, people will benefit from, people would be prepared to buy, mm -hmm. and also build up a, a, a group of uh, of supporters. So talk with with friends, talk with uh, with trusted colleagues, with uh, with network contacts, connections. Discuss kind of the, what you, it's like. Hey, I I'm in the middle of writing this book, which exposes the the tools, tricks, and techniques they use to manipulate you to buying their stuff. What what do you what do you think? Should should I? Is it worth me finishing it? What do you think? Mm. If you get lots of people going, well, I guess then that's probably a sign that maybe I shouldn't write it. But if you get people going. Oh, what? The, tell, me, tell me more about that. What's it about? Oh, you know, you have to write. I want to. I want to buy one of those when, when you've when you've when you when you've written it. You know, you're onto a good start. You can also encourage those people to help you spread word about it. So when you start talking about it as you're writing it, or perhaps you might want to wait until you finish writing it, but it's going through the the editing process and getting ready to be published. Start talking about it. Get them to also talk about it. Get them to share your posts. Build up build up your community, your tribe, whatever you want to call it, of, of supporters, so that when the book is ready to launch, you're going to have a whole bunch of ready-made sales. Then get those people leaving reviews. If if you if you bought a book from from a, a an author friend, or even if you bought a book from an author who's not a friend, but you like the book, that one of the very best things you can do. Go and leave a review for them on Amazon or on Goodreads or anyway. Leave a review. Reviews mm. are a gold dust. Um, because when, when other people are flicking through whatever site and they see all these books and your, I don't know, maybe your cover catches the eye and they pause and have a look and they go, wow, you've got 37 five star reviews. Okay. Let's take a look at this. Yeah. I so, like, yeah. um, yeah, but, but so basically, build 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 a groundswell of support before the book is is even published, so that those people can be also talking about the book before before you you get it out there. Helps to helps to spread the word, and it also means that you know this is a book that there are people would like to buy, um, which then makes it a, a slightly easier easier sell. That and whole also, word of mouth, right? Word That's of mouth. Exactly. That's what it is, right? Yeah. Exactly, and and connect with group. I mean, if if you're right, I, I don't know. Say you're writing a book on how to help help parents with uh, with uh, their kids in the terrible twos. Connect with with lots of parenting groups. 
uh, whether that's on on things like Facebook or LinkedIn or, or, or wherever, or uh, with your with your local parenting groups, so connect with these people, find out more about what they want. Hey, <laughs> with, the, with this sort of book, is that something you'd be interested in? Yeah, if that could help me with this this little monster, I would absolutely love that book. Right, build up your your, your base of support so that when the book comes out, those first ten, fifty, hundred sales. Are much easier to make because once those are made it then becomes easier to build up build up and getting those reviews we talk about even like i'm, I'm on your website as we're chatting you know the pre-orders are open now and everything you already have reviews which is yes. great right so what what i did there and again this is something i learned learned along the way this is book number six and so I've, hopefully i've learned a few things <laughs> along the way but what what i did was i'd, I'd spoken to uh quite a few trusted people and, and network connections about the book. They're all, going, oh, I love the sound of that. You have to write that. I want to, I want to buy a copy. Once I'd finished writing it, but whilst it was still with my editor, so it wasn't the final, final draft. There was still mm, spelling mistakes and typos galore. I asked people that I knew I could trust people who weren't going to just basically take the book and rip it off and, or, uh, or whatever. Uh, would you be happy to read some extracts from the book? For free, bear in mind, it's going to be full of typos. Don't bother me with the typos. My editor's sorting those out. Got his green pen at the ready. But would you be happy to have a look through uh, extracts from the book? Give me some feedback and maybe even give me a little a little blurb that could go in the book and, and, and go on the site. Several people said, yeah, I'd love to. So what I did, I didn't give them the entire book. But what I did was I, I culled sections from the book and gave them a table of contents as well so they could see what the overall content was going to be and they could then get a feel for for some of the chapters they had they had a read of it and they then gave me their their honest honest feedback and, and their comments and their, and their reviews and um so those go on those have gone on the website yeah uh, i've also added them anywhere where uh when you publish the book you can add um review information to it as well and also uh see it there sort of in, just inside yeah. just inside the, the, the book so that when somebody picks the book off the shelf and they have a look the first thing they see is uh is um comments from from about a dozen people about what what they thought of the book which all help helps to lend credibility because it i mean it's one thing if i say hey this book is book is awesome well of course i'd say that i'm the author hmm. but when you've got a dozen people from different walks of life some business owners some in other fields and so on all going this is what i got from the book that then becomes a lot more, but it's it's the whole social proof thing. Yeah, uh, as as we know for for sales in general, uh, it's one thing for me to say I'm great. It's quite another thing for for David to say he's great. And I would say Keith is great. There you oh, go. Thank you. <laughs> and that's and that's the other side of it too that I love is having a podcast. Is you get to come on and and talk community and build community. People get to identify okay. with you. You're you're no longer a website or a book on a desk you're a person yeah right now i'm hearing your voice i'm hearing the excitement you're giving great value and now i feel like that the feeling of reciprocity right i want to give back to you and you've given i feel like i need to get back to you and that whole reciprocity thing is amazing so now being on a podcast is just one more tool to help promote your book and, and build that bridge right yeah Absolutely, and um, I guess one, I guess one, one other point I'd, I'd uh, offer about the whole sales thing is don't don't see every connection you make as uh, as a sale, because a lot of the people, and uh, let, let's make no bones about this, probably the vast majority of of, of people listening to this, they're not going to buy the book. That's absolutely fine, absolutely fine. But they'll have a little bit more understanding about the book. Some will go you know what, let me check that out. And they might check it out and then life comes along and they don't get around to buying it. And again, that's fine because hopefully they'll have got at least got some value from the podcast. Mm -hmm. And there will be a small number who go, let me check that out. And they check it out and they go, actually, you know what? Yeah, let's buy it because I like the sound of uh, what I heard. Um, so sales will happen, but don't don't think of everything as, as chasing the sale. Just think of everything as, Helping more people become aware because the more people are aware of your book, the more chance that people who would like to buy your book will become aware of it. 
That's a good it's, point. It, it is it is a numbers game. So I mean, if like only one in a thousand people would be interested in a particular book, if you speak to a hundred people, there's a ninety a ninety nine percent chance none of them are going to be interested. But if it's one in a thousand like the book, and you you speak to ten thousand, chances are ten people are going to want to buy the book. It, it is purely a numbers game, and also you never know those other nine thousand nine hundred and ninety people. We'll still get some inf- some benefit from it. Some of them might might find it useful. I mean, I'm hoping that uh, some of the uh, people listening are catching this podcast. I'm hoping some of them are going, hit of despair. You know what? Mm-hmm. I've come across that before. I'm going to watch out for that. And even if they don't buy the book, at least it'll help them, protect them against it. And, of course, there'll also be those who they hear the podcast. Oh, that was interesting. Go about their daily lives. Maybe months Months later, they come across, they see a quote from somebody who's, who's read read the book. What's that book I heard about on David's show? Yeah. Uh, let me take a look. You never know where it's, where it's going to lead. Yeah. I love it. And, yeah. and focus on the content. So whatever you're creating, mm. create something that's worth buying. Yeah. Right? You can have the best promotion assets in the world, but if what you're not, what you're putting out into the world doesn't give value to someone, Mm. Who? Why? Why would they buy that? Right. Yeah. So exactly. focus on the content. Yep. Build the Something audience. Right? Worthwhile. And yeah. over time, people I think of it as a slow burn. I mean, you can you can get a big boost to sales at a launch by doing all sorts of stuff. Some manipulative, some not. Uh, in fact, <laughs> one of the stories covered in the book um, was a gentleman called uh, Mike Winnett who showed just how um daft the whole amazon bestseller is mm. he, uh, we talk about how he he um he created a bestseller which was actually a blank book he got it he got it as a number one bestseller talk about that now that's not to say that anyone who has a number one bestseller on amazon is 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 a fraud absolutely not what it's pointing out is it's not necessarily as massive a thing as you think but you you can certainly generate that spike at the start and he generated that spike at the start with with his with his blank book. But do you think he still sells copy of that blank book years later? Of course not. Mm. But if you create books, create the content which will appeal to people as as they find it, you will still get sales over time. I mean, I I still get not as often as I used to, but I still get the occasional royalty check for the very first book that I did, and that would have been about ten years ago. Wow. Now, okay, it's not selling in huge numbers at the moment, but there is still occasion. I'll see. I think, oh wow, roll the check from that. Oh, cool, that means some more people have 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 liked the idea of the book enough to buy it. I hope they find it useful. Uh, it might not. It might not buy me a, a nice mansion, but you know what? From time to time, it, I I get uh, get the occasional um, Chinese takeaway treat paid for by them. So nice. Yeah. <laughs> so think of it as 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 a long term thing, and also one other thing for for authors and this is particularly for non-fiction but also for fiction you uh, you can use it for fiction as well depending on, on how you do it don't think of the book as a means to to make to make lots of money chances are it will probably cost you uh, at least it to get started is going to cost cost you money but think of your book as a marketing tool mm-hmm. think of it as probably the most expensive business card you will ever have <laughs> but it's a marketing asset yeah uh, because you now have a book which establishes you as an expert in that topic. If you're trying to, to get a meeting with, uh, with an MD of a company and you've written a book which which really transforms what that company does, for example, yeah, phoning them up, phoning them, emailing them, you'll always get the gatekeeper. Oh, yeah, I'll get him to call you, but well, I'll, I'll pass the message on. It's happen. Send them a copy of that book. People love lumpy mail. I mean, we get deluged by emails these days, but <laughs> yeah. we like it when we get get things to the, the chances yeah. are that book is going to be passed straight to the person. They might not read it. They might read it at some point. Whoa. Yeah. And you've left that little note there saying, I'd love to have a chat with you because I think this is how we could help your company. They read the book. Mm-hmm. They go, actually, you know what? I'm going to give, give them, give them a call. Yeah. It's, it open opens up the doorway to, to so many places. Plus, of course, it means you can say if it's, if it's a, 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 a relatively niche book in a particular or a relatively yeah if, if it's a book in a relatively niche topic mm-hmm. 
what do I know about uh, uh, anti manipulation? I wrote the book on it. There you go. <laughs> Which is a cheesy line, but mm-hmm. again, it's just like, yeah. you what? You wrote the book on it? Tell me more. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Keith, there's so much, there's so much great value here. And I'm I'm so glad to have you on. I'm glad that we could use your new book as a little case study for our conversation. It really gives context yeah. to but what I, I you've hope written. I hope it's helped uh, many of the authors listening. I hope hope it's given them some ideas. They're going, oh, actually. I'm going to do that. That'll, and I hope it, it leads them to a greater exposure for their books and greater sales for their books. And we ask people on this podcast to support the story, to support the show by supporting our guests and purchasing their books. And that's that's really the whole idea for the podcast. And we're being really upfront and open here is mm-hmm. having these great guests on, sharing their journey, sharing their stories. The idea here is to introduce you to new books and new authors so that you can follow along their journey and, and support them. So that's my encouragement for those people that are listening this far and saying, listen, you know, you've listened this far, you've got some great value so far. There's, we've just touched a portion of what's in this book. And I would love for you to go and support Keith and, and support all the great things he's doing. The pre-orders out, the podcast is going to go out soon. So we're still going to be in that window. I would love for people to go and, and not only buy the book, but leave the review as well for Keith and support him as he gets his word out. Because, uh, again, going back to f- that funny feeling of walking into an, a situation where you feel like you're unprepared and you don't have the knowledge um, and you feel like you're you're open to being sold something you don't really need. Like a good friend, like we talked about when you're buying the car, standing beside you, I really mm-hmm. think this book is going to help you to have confidence in that situation. So Keith will be your best friend when you walk in to buy that computer or whatever that is, you'll have Keith there because you've had this book in your back pocket. So I think everyone should go buy it. That's what I'm saying. So, Thank you, too. Thank you. But yeah, I, I hope I hope people find it useful. Um, check it out. I mean, you, you, you can go to antimanipulation.com and find out all about the book to be able to order it. It's through all the... All the normal places, Amazon, Apple, all these things. It's in paperback, it's in ebook. Or you can buy copies directly from me again, again through the site. Um, but yeah, if and only if you find it interesting, only if you think it is going to be of use to you, love, love for you to buy it. And please, as, as David says, do leave reviews for, for this book and also for any other books that, that you've bought and enjoyed. Leave reviews and one interesting thing is people sometimes say, oh, I bought the book, but I can't leave an Amazon review because I bought it from somewhere else. Amazon will let anyone review the book. If you bought it from them, then you get a little verified purchase uh, tag on it so people know that you have bought the book through Amazon. But you can still leave reviews, and they'll even let you put a photo. So you could have a photo of you with the book to prove that you bought it and, and, and leave your review. And there's also other sites like goodreads.com. is a great site for for connecting yeah. with authors and leaving leaving them reviews, but uh, do do leave reviews for 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 all all of your favorite authors. And if any book has has helped you in some way, inspired you to think differently, to look at, look at life in a different way, or even just made you made you happy, yeah, do leave them a review. It it will mean so much, especially for for in indie authors and smaller authors. Every review means so much. Nice. Really Keith, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. We'll have all the links in the show notes for everyone so they can follow along and and see your journey and support you. So thank you so much for making time for us. Let's um, keep from being manipulated. And (laughs) this is the book right here to help us. So thank you, Keith. Thanks for being part of the podcast again. Appreciate you investing time in the show and you're listening this far thank you one thing to keep in mind is we are looking for help and some support for the podcast if you are able to help support our show our little podcast show here we can go over to livingthenextchapter.com and all the instructions will be there to help support the show it takes about 30 to 40 dollars a month to do this just for the hosting and all of that other stuff that we pay for but if the show is giving you any value and you and you're enjoying what's happening here 
would love any kind of support that you can offer. That would be great. And you being here and sharing the show helps us grow. Helps us get great new authors on the show, connect with other listeners, and build community. So whatever you can do to share this show today, I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here on for living the next chapter, and I can't wait to share the next one with you. Talk soon. Have a great day. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.